Thank you, Catherine. It's always a great pleasure for me to visit this institute, as I'm sure you all know. And it's a special privilege to be at an event that's associated with your 20th birthday. And it's a real honor to have a chance to contribute to this commemoration of Senator Jim Doog. I did meet Jim Doog in the context of the ad hoc committee, and I followed closely its work. Um, and those of you who scramble around trying to find out what's happening inside meetings like that might be amused to know that in the pre-internet days, I was very fortunate that off the back of a non-electronic lorry fell the papers of the Duke Committee in real time. <laughs> so I read the papers as Catherine and others were in those meetings, which was wonderful. And it was crystal clear as I watched it in real time, and I was just a humble academic trying to figure out what was going on, just how smart the exercise was and just how remarkable the contribution was that Jim Doog made as chair. I've been asked to make a few remarks on wider institutional issues, and I'll do that obviously in a context where we're now dealing with a different process of treaty reform. Um, and where treaty reform is not an easy business in this country, and it's certainly not an easy business in the country that I know best. And my remarks will fall under four headings, the single European Act story. I'll say something slightly different from what Bridget has said. Second, I want to say something about the link between policy objectives and institutional methods. Third, I want to say a word or two about Lisbon. And then one or two very careful remarks about my own country and where it sits in this process. Bridget left it to right at the end to say that it kept being Britain that was in the footnotes. <laughs> and that's a continuing story. Um, on the Single European Act, in all the academic literature on the European Union, the Single European Act is really described as a critical juncture between an old, slightly stalled process and the relaunch that we all came to associate with Jacques Delors. Um, and it's certainly true, and I say this in, with absolute certainty, the Duke Committee did a remarkable job in that period in separating out where it was possible to envisage agreement on reform and where it was simply not worth continuing the discussion. Bridget didn't say, but it's worth remembering, the intergovernmental conference that followed took only three months. It was done and dusted with remarkable dexterity and speed. And throughout that process, there was an absolutely clear focus on the policy objectives that were being sought. As Bridget has said, the single market, cohesion and enlargement. And it relegated the insoluble to the footnotes and just they were not discussed in the IGC. At the time, it seemed quite dull. And that's why there was that famous piece in The Economist saying, maybe this is just a mouse of a reform. But it became a lion, and the great Delors Relance took forward. But actually, I think when I look back with hindsight, yes, it was a critical juncture. But in some senses, that was the end of an era rather than the beginning of a new era. What do I mean by that? With the exception of the Delors Committee, which prepared the economic and monetary union side of the Maastricht process, no other preparatory committee has done anything like the job that the Duke Group did. They have tried and failed. They've tried and failed maybe because they had less talented people, and that was certainly important, but also because times changed. And in this sense, and I mean this as a compliment, the Duke Committee in the Single Act process was sort of the last fling of the Monet methodology before we moved into a different kind of world. And I just want to say how much we've lost, <laughs> because I think that was a golden <coughs> moment um, that we shouldn't underestimate. That brings me to my second point, the link between policy objectives and institutional methods. I'm going to be very nostalgic. I think the accumulated evidence on the history of the European Union is pretty clear that institutional design and institutional redesign work best when they're tied to well-specified policy objectives. And I 
and indeed they work best when there's also been some empirical experimentation with the methods that people want to take forward. If institutional design is linked to policy objectives, it makes it easier to see how the interests of the member states can be invested in substantive policy outcomes. Stakeholders can be identified. Stakeholders can identify themselves and they can be co-opted into the process. In the case of the single act and the single market, that was quite clear. And let's remember that Mrs. Thatcher also proposed at the Dublin European Council chaired by Garrett a move to informal majority voting because she was prepared to experiment with an informal mechanism and eventually was uh, pulled along with treaty reform. And why did, was that so? Because Mrs. Thatcher really cared about the policy substance and she wanted others to bloody well learn how to run markets properly, which is what she thought she was expert at. Um, now, the treaty reforms that followed, Maastricht had some of the same about it, the economic and monetary union side, very clear specification of policy objectives and the methods to go with it. But subsequent treaties were simply not like that. Amsterdam, not really. Nice, the Constitutional Treaty and Lisbon were all conspicuous in, in my judgment, lacking clear policy objectives, bereft of stakeholders, and focused on abstract institutional issues. And I'm not saying those institutional issues aren't important. Of course I'm not. But it's much harder to pin them down and see why they matter in the absence of the stakeholders. And it's much less clear to see where the salience is for that. And you people know only too well in this country. On abstract issues, it's much easier to rally the no-sayers than to conscript the yes-sayers. So that's a story the Irish know well, but it's not only the Irish, um, the Dutch, the French, and so on. So the question that I'm left with here is whether it can be envisaged that future treaty amendments might be reassociated with the policy-driven version of treaty reform uh, rather than with institutions uh, in abstraction. Or has the page of history turned and can we not turn it back? <coughs> this brings me to my third point, the Treaty of Lisbon. The Treaty of Lisbon was born out of disagreement and it was born out of the failed ratification of the Constitutional Treaty. I'm not a fan of the Treaty of Lisbon, I'm sorry. It had no clear policy drivers. It was a toning down of rhetoric and content compared with the Constitutional Treaty and actually no agreement on a coherent institutional design. So the link was missing between functional substance and what might be considered appropriate institutional methodology. And that's what I don't like about it. On the policy side, my own view is that there were some missed opportunities. The most obvious one for me is that the moment was not seized to sharpen the focus in the treaties on the climate change, environment and energy agenda. It seems to me that was such an obvious one to have included. With hindsight, it might have been useful to focus on evolving needs for improved economic governance, but that had been knocked off the agenda during the Constitutional Convention. And on the external policies side, which is very important, common foreign and security policy, security and defence policy, no real momentum was built in the Lisbon discussions around the substantive objectives, as opposed to the procedural objectives, of dealing with foreign policy. And I have to say here, I think the government of my country completely bottled it on that, because if the British had been prepared to be more activist on substantive issues relating to common foreign and security policy, that might have made a real difference. On the institutional side, personally I find the provisions of Lisbon somewhat contradictory, and I'm now going to upset people. More powers again to the European Parliament, chaps, both co-decision and beyond. Maybe too many powers to the European Parliament, 
Some headroom for national parliaments not yet tested. A loss of profile and scope for commission entrepreneurship. European Council presidency. I think you've got Van Rompuy next week. Um, at the price of weakening the rotating presidency of the member states and distancing prime ministers from the presidency countries from the process. And a procedurally ambiguous approach to external action capabilities. So here we have a treaty with difficult content to defend politically. You folk know that better than I do. And quite difficult to implement effectively. So you in Ireland don't need me to tell you this, but it's not only in Ireland. Let me flag here the difficult experiences in Germany and in the UK. Germany's been through a very difficult period of contestation before the Constitutional Court. And the outcome of that process in Germany is what might turn out to be a really quite significant tightening of constraints on the German government's room for manoeuvre. I'll come back to the UK in a moment. Tricky ratification and lots of political fallout. So the problems that you've experienced firsthand in Ireland are problems that are endemic much more broadly. Let me say just a word about the implementation of Lisbon. As I've said already, I'm a bit worried the European Parliament's getting carried away by its further enhanced powers. I'm worried that the Commission is losing focus and losing its capacity to aggregate interest. I'm still not persuaded that the European Council's new format provides added value as opposed to confusion. And I'm very concerned that the development of the EU's external capabilities has been mired in so much procedural contention. We've spent a year on the arguments. So I'm not very happy about all of that. This brings me to a few final remarks on developments in my country. And I'll try to choose my words very, very carefully here. And I have to make clear that I speak only for myself. Uh, as some of you will know, William, my husband, is a member of the current government and is, amongst other things, involved in some of the European policy discussions, and I speak for myself, I don't speak for him. The backcloth. In a European Union context, my assessment is that British governments are pretty smart at addressing functional needs and policy substance in a European Union context. They're repeatedly much less smart at dealing with the institutional issues. And it suits the British better, therefore, to be engaged in reform processes where the links are made very tightly between policy objectives and institutional changes. Second part of the backcloth, the previous government in Britain, the Labour government, <coughs> found itself caught in a trap by commitments made by all British political parties to advocate a referendum to ratify the constitutional treaty. Its escape route was to downplay the Treaty of Lisbon and try to make it sound very dull, and as dull as the single European Act had appeared to be at the time. And that was the basis on which Lisbon was ratified in Britain. But there remained and remain much political distrust about that process. So what of the current situation? Well, at a practical level, the current coalition government in Britain is dealing with European policy day to day, constructively and pragmatically. And I do think that the presence of ministers from my own party, the Liberal Democrats in government, has made a difference to that and that the more Eurosceptical wing of the Conservative Party has much less leverage on the process than might otherwise have been the case, although, of course, there's a residue of problems for the Conservative Party in the European Parliament. So that's good news. But then there is... I don't know how many of you who have read it closely. The European Union bill currently going through Westminster... 
and I just want to say a word about that. Um, some of you will have looked at it, others not. The EU bill does three things. It reasserts parliamentary sovereignty, firstly. Secondly, it makes provision for referenda on future transfers of power to the European Union. Not only by the obvious treaty amending processes, but also by less explicit processes of change. In other words, to avoid what was being said in Parliament again last night is called competence creep. And thirdly, the EU bill seeks to insist on primary legislation at Westminster to endorse certain kinds of policy development, especially those that arise from the passerelle that are in the treaties, which in UK parlance are now called ratchets. Not quite so <laughs> gentle a word. So we've caught the Irish disease on referenda, except that we want them more often and under even more conditions and eventualities. And we've caught the German disease on extensive parliamentary processes of ratification. Well, the bill's still in Parliament. We have yet to see how it emerges in detail. But I have to say to you that if it comes through in anything like its current form, which it probably will, it will considerably constrain this and future governments on EU policy. It tilts the process in Britain more by way of standing aside and opting out and distancing from policy developments. And that includes timorousness, which I regret, in relation to external policies. And since the Irish necessarily have to pay attention to their British neighbours, I thought maybe I should at least give you my take on them. In conclusion, I'd like to turn the clock back 25 years or so, both for the EU as a whole and for my own country, in terms of rediscovering <coughs> what was possible with the Duke Committee and the Single Act in this very tight linkage between functional policy priorities and institutional methods. It would be a real comfort to know that there was still real scope for talented individuals to bring thoughtful and skillful deliberation to the process of European construction. And as a British European, I'd much prefer to see the no-go areas for us in the footnotes and not in the main text. I realise I'm being very unrealistic, but my nostalgia is prompted by remembering the great contribution of Senator Duke. Thank you.